That is a song called Press Gang from a band called the Murder City Devils and an album called In Name and Blood. And the Murder City Devils, one of my all-time favorite bands. I played these guys mucho back in the day when I used to DJ. They have dissolved. They are no more. I think they did three or four albums and then went on to do other things such as Pretty Girls Make Graves, Modest Mouse, Dead Low Tide. And the lead singer, Spencer Moody, I think went on to open a antique store of all things so that's what he's doing this is hexes and soldiers episode 21 my name is jason i hope everybody has been well since we last spoke i'm doing fine myself the post office is running me ragged but the pay is good and unfortunately i need money so it is a marriage of convenience Um, by way of shout outs i'd like to say hey to anybody and everybody who has placed a war game on their table And let you guys know that you are the vanguard of the gaming community. Don't let anybody tell you different. And then just a quick specific shout out to Kev Sharp, a.k.a. Hipshot, a.k.a. The Big Board. Hopefully you have a big heart. And will hook me up with this four battles of Army Group South. Uh, I know the figure that I shot you might be a little lower than you wanted. Um, I understand if that's the case. No problem, my brother. Um, What have I been up to? Well, I went and saw a movie, and I only relate this because I rarely get out other than to go to work and get supplies. Um, Not that I don't like movies, just hardly ever get out. So yeah, I went out and saw uh, the Grand Budapest Hotel, and this, of course, is Wes Anderson's latest feature. For those of you not familiar with Wes Anderson, well, you have a lot of movies to watch to get caught up. This might be his second best, in my humble opinion, uh, the first being the Royal Tenenbaums, which I don't believe he will ever top. Um, but it's a great story, and like a lot of his movies, it watches like you would read a story. And uh, by way of metaphor, if you were ever a kid and built a tent fort in the living room, that's kind of the experience you get from watching his movies with this childlike imagination and creativity which is a wonderful thing the grand budapest hotel is the movie uh i enjoyed it if you get time go out and see it and then um yeah as this show is episode 21 i don't know what this show's intentions are by way of celebration but uh i would assume if it goes out it'll probably attempt to do 21 shots and uh Hopefully it has a designated driver, but I've never seen this show inebriated, so that could prove entertaining and or scary, to say the least. Also got to whine for a second and get it out of my system about you-know-who. The Blues are struggling, lost six in a row. A team that was uh, at the top looking down at everybody else, stood to win the uh, President's Trophy, the division, the conference. Um, We were going to have to play Minnesota, and now we're stuck having forfeited all that, lost six in a row, and we have to play Chicago in the first round, so the way I look at it, there's only four games left because Chicago's going to sweep us. We are struggling. We've got injuries. It's a shame, but it's the Blues, so the curse is alive and well, and uh, this proves it. Anyway, uh, what else? ASL, I've got uh, Action Pack 9 to the bridge en route to the... uh, headquarters here in the Crescent City, as well as From the Bunker, which is a compilation of scenarios, ASL scenarios from Dispatches from the Bunker, which was a third-party ASL um, company. So, got those two coming, and then uh, that's roughly it, and as far as what I've been gaming and what's on the table, I will get to that in the meat of the matter, or if you will, the Situation Room. So, As far as news goes in the industry, it looks like, uh, yeah, regarding Action Pack 9, which I finally was able to order because I did not pre-order it. Well, yeah, you can do the same. If you miss the pre-order thing, well, you don't have to be special anymore. Anybody can order it and get it. So Action Pack 9 is up for grabs. And Revolution Games has something that looked relatively interesting. Uh, They have this thing called Invasion 1066 The Battle of Hastings which is the exciting new game designed by Norm Smith. 
originally published as Sinlek Hill by Saxon Games. They have enhanced this great design by developing the rule set even further and providing new artwork by industry veteran Charles Keebler. And this guy, I believe, unless I'm mistaken, has done work for uh, ASL, so he is well established in the industry. Can you, as William the Conqueror, become King of England? Or will Harold deny the invader and keep his throne? Map scale is 50 meters per hex, and the units vary in size from 100 to 250 men. The game is quick playing and bloody, with easy to understand mechanics. Historical touches such as cavalry charges, army morale by troop type, leader loss, arrow supply, Saxon javelins, the papal banner. It's all here in a very easy to play package. The game is available for pre-order now and should ship in late May. Attending Consum World Expo, well, they will have the game for sale on site there at the Revolution Games booth along with all of their other games as well. The second game in the series, Invasion 1066, The Battle of Stamford Bridge, should be released later this year or early next year. And Vikings vs. Saxons in a wild, wide open game. So there's that. And then regarding Consum World Expo, you still got a bit of time if you're uh, undecided about whether or not you want to go. But this thing is going to be held in May this year from the 25th to the 31st and I'm really leaning towards going to this thing I've never been to a con or you know an expo or anything like that um, I'm sure it would be a hell of an experience and should be lots of fun so also have against the odds issue 42 a thunder upon the land and it says before Hitler before Napoleon Another European strongman invaded Russia and came to grief. He was Charles XII of Sweden. And, you know, again, I, I want to do this thing where I compare and contrast uh, Hitler and Napoleon and their invasion of Russia. And, you know, I could even throw this gentleman from Sweden in and do all three. But anyway, in later years, they would call it the Great Northern War. Um, whether the blame can be tagged to Swedish expansionism or Peter the Great's desire for that warm water capital city and, quote, window on Europe, end of quote, the clash was a seemingly inevitable clash over who would own what in northern and eastern Europe and what shape Poland would take, if any. When the war started, it resembled something Frederick the Great would face a, quote, everyone against one country, end quote, conflict that saw Russia joined by Denmark, Norway, and a Saxon, Poland, Lithuania combination, with others joining later, all seeking to take advantage of the 18-year-old Charles XII, who was perceived to be weak and inexperienced. Like Frederick, he would parry multiple invasions and survive. Unlike Frederick, he would launch a serious invasion deep into Russia and fall from power. A Thunder Upon the Land looks as the Sweden versus Russia portion of this war with the two battles that rather started and finished the conflict and the Battle of Narva took place in 1700 as Russia and a Saxon Polish contingent aimed to push Sweden out of the Baltic with the Saxons threatening Riga and the Russians besieging Narva and uh, this would not be the last battle fought in that region as we will see shortly but it was November, and Peter left his army feeling secure that his 40,000 men could bottle up and capture the 2,500 Swedes holding the city. Charles rushed to relieve the city with an army that was well-drilled and well-equipped, but numbered only about 8,000 men. So, including the troops in the city, he would be attacking something like 1 to 4 odds, and attacking in a blizzard which sounds awesome. But the surprise and wretched weather worked to his advantage, and virtually the entire Russian army was killed or captured, along with their artillery and equipment. It was Russia's finest force at the time, and an immediate invasion by Sweden might well have exceeded, but there was Riga and the Saxons to consider, and Charles let the moment pass. Now, everybody, or a lot of people, tend to perceive Russia, or did, as big bad Russia or a threat, but I'll tell you what, these guys get invaded again and again and again, and I can't blame them for being paranoid. Three years later, having knocked the Saxons out of the war, Charles turned again to Russia, who had surprised Europe by founding St. Petersburg on what was then still Swedish territory. 
Charles aimed for Moscow, and this time it was a Swedish army that vanished from the map. A Thunder Upon the Land brings you both Battles of Narva and Poltava with full-color maps and over 250 die-cut counters. Each turn represents about an hour of real time, and each hex represents about 500 yards. The game uses chit draw, and now more and more games are doing this, I see, for wing activation and allows players to make tactical choices like forming squares or deciding if their dragoons will press home charges or use the safer but less effective caracol attacks with optional rules for volley fire and desperation attacks. And finally, of course, can you, as Charles XII, maintain Sweden's status as the rising power in Europe? Can you, as Peter I, defeat the invaders and open the great city you gave your name to? The choices are yours as you refight the battles of Narva and Poltava. And then there's this thing called Battles Magazine, which I will thank Marco Wargamer for uh, alerting me to. But uh, the magazine, Wargame Magazine, it looks great. And then the war game that is included in this thing, which would be the current issue number nine, uh, entitled The Flowers of the Forest, looks uh, amazing. And... Give this, give this a look. Go to either the Battles Magazine site or hit up Marco Wargamer. It's one of his recent posts. He gives a pretty thorough review of this game. But, uh, yeah, I'm contemplating getting it. It, it. it looks that good. So give that a look as well. And then I think that pretty much covers it as far as news this week. And then by way of list, and perhaps I should stop myself and also say that I'm trying to keep this particular episode somewhat short and uh, that's because there might be a, a few after this that run a little long so I don't want to keep doing a long thing but uh, as far as the list goes I compiled a list of games that are well that have their titles taken from other things and uh, you'll get the drift real quick Victory Point Games uh, has a game entitled Hell's Gate, and this is by designer Philip Sabin, who also uh, teaches basically a college course, more or less, on war games in England. But uh, this is based on a book by the same name, Hell's Gate, by a, an author uh, named Nash. And I've looked at this thing and read many wonderful things about it. Apparently, this is the book when it comes to Course and Pocket, which I will be focusing on here before too long. But uh, <clears throat> apparently it's a coffee table sized book with pictures, and it is about as comprehensive as you can get or would want to get and still be able to enjoy the thing. But uh, yeah, Hell's Gate, the game, um, don't have it, haven't played it. It looks kind of simplistic, but uh, that's not to say that it is. But the book... I will be ordering this thing at some day. This this thing is a thing of beauty, and uh, we'll be ordering that for sure. And then you have Paths of Glory by GMT, based on a movie by Mr. Stanley Kubrick. And if you haven't seen Paths of Glory, a uh, wonderful movie. Of course, Kubrick, fantastic director. Um, do yourself a favor and give it a watch. Then MMP has The Mighty Endeavor, which they are... Uh, reprinting and expanding and uh, this new <clears throat> version of the Mighty Endeavor will allow players to play both the East and West during the later part of the war but uh, this is based on a book by the same name The Mighty Endeavor The American War in Europe by Charles MacDonald and I haven't read that and know little or nothing about it so I'll leave it up to you to learn and then uh, G Game Designers Workshop, I should say, Scorched Earth, which is the expansion slash final development of Fire in the East, which was an expansion and further development of a couple other things. But this was uh, also a book by Mr. Paul Carell by the same name as Scorched Earth. And uh, Paul Carell, I'm not really sure how accurate history wise the man is but uh he does write history and i'm sure there's plenty of, of you out there that are familiar with him and love him but uh 
yeah, I'll leave it I'll, again. I'll leave that up to you as well. And then the gamers of Frozen Hell, also a book uh, entitled A Frozen Hell of the Russo Finnish Winter War of 1939 to 1940 by a Mr. William Trotter. So it looks like a lot of these games just straight pulled their titles from from books. But uh, Bitter Woods, uh, also a book written by John Eisenhower uh, regarding the same subject, and then course Avalon Hills The Longest Day as well as SPI's A Bridge Too Far both books by Mr. Cornelius Ryan and this guy is uh, one of the top authors in the field if you haven't read anything by Mr. Cornelius Ryan you're missing out and uh, I'm not sure why you'd want to do that and then finally I have It Never Snows uh, the game by M&P also a book entitled It Never Snows in September by Robert Kershaw, and of course this is the Market Garden book uh, written from the German perspective with interviews, etc. And of course the name, I believe, comes from uh, a German uh, who was watching the paratroops fall from the sky and said something to the effect that, is it snowing? There were so many parachutes littering the sky, and another German says it never snows in September. So there you go your list for this week. I uh, hope you enjoyed that. And then, as far as the meat of the matter or the situation room goes, we are heading back to the East Front, and I feel good about this. It's been a while. This is where I belong. I've got a hotel room booked for a number of weeks here on the East Front, so we'll be staying for a while. And this week, I'll start with the Battle of Narva. So regarding the Battle of Narva, you have Germany's Army Group North, which had been besieging Leningrad for over two years at this point. In January of 44, the RKKA, or the Workers and Peasants Red Army, under General Govrov, launched an offensive that threatened to encircle the besieging army. And through a series of skillful rearguard actions, the 3rd SS Panzer Corps was able to withdraw to the natural defensive position of the Narva River near the city of Narva. And as they arrived, the German forces found that the defensive fortification of the Panther Line, and this thing was uh, also known as the Panther Wotan Line, and this was a defensive line partially built by the Germans in uh, 43. The first part of the name refers to the short northern section between Lake Papus and the Baltic Sea at Narva. But the purpose of this thing was uh, Hitler hoped to repeat the success of wor the World War I Hindenburg Line, which was on the Western Front. And this thing allowed the Germans to shorten their front line and release many troops for operations elsewhere in case the Wehrmacht was no longer capable of launching a decisive strategic offensive against the Red Army. So Hitler wanted to force a conclusive draw or Russia before the Allied armies in the West <clears throat> became a major threat. So with the Panther line, Hitler indicated a desire to return to attrition warfare that was uh, prevalent during World War I. And Hitler's order cons to construct this thing in August of 43, following the Battle of Kursk, and Joseph Goebbels' total war speech delivered on the 18th of February of 43, displays Hitler's abandonment of Blitzkrieg. And uh, I don't know if this was a willing ab abandonment, but a, a necessary abandonment because he was almost unable to conduct any sort of blitzkrieg offensive action anymore. In fact, anything at this point and beyond that is even entitled offensive is really just a kind of inverted defensive. And that goes for the Battle of the Bulge as well. I don't think this was so much an offensive as more of a, uh, like I say, inverted defensive, if that makes any sense. But anyway, in his, Hitler's tacit admission that the Wehrmacht was no longer capable of launching large-scale operations against the Soviets, uh, he hoped to bleed the Red Army against the line in a manner similar to trench warfare uh, that was seen on the Western Front. So he hoped the Russians, having suffered appalling casualties during 41 and 42, due to the successful Blitzkrieg assaults, would suffer a similar fate against a strong defensive line. And, uh, however, as later events would depict, this line would become a complete failure. 
and I think it was already a failure in its inception and conception. The Germans, especially at this point, were not built to defend. They, they had really garnered much, if not all, of their success on uh, attacking. And uh, yeah, So this thing really pretty much just existed on paper anyway. I mean, it, you know, like a lot of things in Hitler's mind, he looked at a map, he looked at paper, and, and in his mind these things actually existed in reality on the field, but uh, nine times out of ten this wasn't the case. So there were a few emplacements uh, from the invasion in 41, but generally uh, these were in poor locations for the current battle, and the ground was frozen, making the preparation of any new trench lines difficult and not impossible. However, the terrain offered a choke point with Lake Papas in the south and the Gulf of Finland to the north, connected by the south to north running Narva River. So the river represents the border between Russia and the Baltic nation of Estonia, and if the RKKA could just drive the Germans from Narva, they'd remove the invaders from the whole region. So this would score both a strategic and a political victory for Stalin's armies. And the river was icy, and the bridges were the key to both the defense of Narva and the success of the Soviet attacks. So the Red Army did not wait for the Germans to settle. On, on the 2nd of February, you've got the 2nd Shock Army, led by Major General Fedioninsky, immediately attacking the German bridgehead on the east side of the Narva River. And this bridgehead was a seven-mile-long line stretching from the village of Lilienbach in the north to the village of Dolgaja Neva in the south. And manning this position were troops from the 4th SS Free Willen Panzer Grenadier Brigade in Nederland and the 11th SS Free Willen Panzer Grenadier Division in Nordland. And these units were unusual in that they consisted of volunteers from European countries other than Germany. And what you have going on here with these volunteers is... Uh, a number of people that perceive the Soviets as <clears throat> oh, invaders, for lack of a better term. So they join with the Germans in an attempt to prevent this. And on February 3rd, the Soviet attack began with a thrust through the defenses on the east side of the river, and the Soviet tanks broke through and threatened to establish their own bridgehead on the west side of the river. Uh, the Nordland's Panzer Battalion, named Hermann von Salza, and the Tiger tanks of 502, Schwerer Panzer Abtelung, the 502nd Heavy Tank Battalion, which included Tiger Ace, Lieutenant Otto Karius, joined the battle. And they defeated the Soviet armor, and with their support, and the Nordland infantry was able to recapture their position on the east side of the river. Then on uh, February 11th, the 43rd Rifle Corps attacks north of the city, but is met with heavy resistance from the 227th Grenadier Division and the SS Nederland Brigade in the south, attacks by the 109th and the 122nd Rifle Corps were somewhat more successful, advancing about seven and a half miles before being stopped by SS Nordland, um, 170th Grenadier Division and the Panzer Grenadier Division Feldrumhal. So the Soviets decided to attempt an amphibious landing northwest of Narva to meet the troops driving up from the southeast and encircling the German forces. And the landing was made by the 115th and 260th Naval Infantry Brigades. And the night of February 13th is when this took place. The Germans had been forewarned of the attempt and only 432 men managed to land. All their communication equipment was lost and therefore they could receive no support from the Soviet fleet. They were all killed or captured by February 17th. And the Soviet assaults continued up and down the Narva defensive line in the north. The Soviets had established a bridgehead on the west side of the river near the village of Severtsi. And you've got SS Obergruppenführer Steiner receiving control of the Estonian 20th Waffen Grenadier Division, their SS, on February 8th. Uh, these fresh troops were committed to the line on February 20th, replacing the battered, war-weary 9th and 10th Luftwaffe field divisions. And after nine days of heavy fighting, the Soviets were again forced back to the east side of the river. On February 14th, the Stavka issued new orders to General Govorov. 
and they went something like this. It is mandatory that our forces seize Narvan no later than the 17th of February, 44. This is required both for military as well as political reasons. It is the most important thing right now. I demand that you undertake all necessary measures to liberate Narva no later than the period indicated. And this was a decree by Stalin, known as Stavka VGK Directive Number 220025 to the Leningrad Front Commander concerning the periods for the liberation of Narva. So moving along, a fresh Soviet assault south of Narva by the 30th Guard Rifle Corps broke through the defensive line and established a bridgehead. Then by February 24th, the assault forces had swung in a wide arc around Narva, reaching a rail line supporting the city and threatening to encircle the defenders. It was stopped when Division Feldhernhal and the 502nd Shore Panzer Abdelong counterattacked. After a week of relative quiet, March saw a renewed offensive by the Soviets, and at dawn on the 1st of March, the Red Army began a 20-minute artillery barrage against the Nazi position. And uh, this was followed by the advance of units from the 2nd Shock Army, the 2nd Rifle Corps, the 59th Army, 109th Rifle Corps, and the 43rd Rifle Corps. The artillery barrage proved to have been inadequate, though, against the deeply dug-in defenders, and the advance is halted due to heavy casualties. Accurate and timely German artillery played a large part in breaking up the advances, as did the Luftwaffe, even though the Red Army enjoyed a roughly 3-to-1 advantage in air power along the front. And on March 1st, uh, you, you have an ending of all advances. They were just completely halted, and there was little to no gain for the Soviets. Then General Govorov attempts to revive the assault in the second, bringing fresh forces to bear against the Narva defenses, and these attacks also floundered with little gain to show. Rather than allow the Soviets to consolidate the few gains they had achieved, the German forces launched a vicious series of counterattacks on March the 4th through the 6th, and these attacks recaptured the lost territory and returned the lines to their February locations. And in response, on the night of the March 6th, 7th, the Red Air Force made a massive bombing raid of the city of Narva, reducing it to ruins. The surviving civilians fled west, but the air raid and artillery bombardment that followed uh, did not greatly harm the defenders, and Govorov continued attacking up and down the Narva line, seeking a weakness in the defenses. One attack against Nederland's 49th SS Freewillen Panzer Grenadier Regiment named the Reuter broke through toward the river. Govorov committed his tank reserves with orders to seize the bridges across the river into the city, and the defenders counterattacked with Nordland's Hermann von Salza Panzer Abdelong. And the Panzers stopped the advancing tanks, but they were prevented from exploiting their advantage by heavy anti-tank fire from the east side of the river. And on March the 23rd, Hitler ordered the creation of Festung Narva, a fortress city that was to be held at all costs. The Germans launched a series of counterattacks beginning on March 26th, and these attacks were designed to eliminate the Soviet bridgehead gained by the 30th Guard Rifle Corps in February on the west side of the river. And in this, they were mostly successful driving the Red Forces back to the river, but not across it. And these attacks could not be sustained with the equipment and manpower available, but the threat was sufficient that General Govorov ordered the construction of extensive defensive works on the east side of the river to prevent a possible breakout. And then finally, by the end of March, the RKKA was not able to defeat the Reich's defense of Narva, and the Germans succeeded in rapidly reinforcing their positions while the Soviets were hampered in their attacks, both by the terrain and a poor command and control system between the various units in the sector. The thaw in April and the Rasputitsa, or muddy season, had forced a halt to all major operations until late May. So there's the history of the Battle of Narva, and I thank the Flames of War website, and specifically Wayne from Battlefront, um, from which I called a lot of this information. And also you had... Uh, three hills and uh, three key positions that were defended as well uh, during this battle but one of them uh, Grenadier Hill 
was assaulted, uh, defend, obviously defended by the Germans, but was assaulted by six Soviet tank brigades and 11 rifle divisions. And it was stopped by a single guy, a single German soldier, who uh, was manning the 75mm anti-tank gun. Now this sounds hard to believe, but this is what I'm reading from another source. And then the next hour he took out seven Soviet tanks by himself before him being knocked unconscious when his own gun was hit by a tank round. So there was some bitter, heavy, uh, not give an inch type fighting going on during this battle. And, well, it looks like it worked for the time being. I think what happened is the Soviets just said, hell with it, we'll just go around it, which perhaps they should have done to begin with. But, again, that's the history. And then that brings us to Army Group Narva, The Game. And this is published by if I can get this right, Kokusai Chushin Company Limited and Three Crowns Game Productions. That would be my people in Sweden, and uh, they're doing some good stuff with other things as well. But came out in 2012, designer Steven Ekstrom, who also did the art for this game, um, did Plan West, if any of you are familiar with that, as well as Koenigsberg 45, which M&P picked up, I believe. He's also the co-designer of Pax Baltica, which GMT picked up and distributed. And as well as what might be one of the spiciest names in wargaming, or titles rather, Don't Let a Bastard Over the Bridge. Uh, another game with an exciting title. Anyway, Three Crowns Game Productions is, uh, they say, a gathering of three friends with over 90 years of combined game design behind them. Tons of games have been invented, played, and enjoyed, and some scrapped as well over the years. And the company is a product of their dream to produce a high-quality game with the primary aim to have a good time and, at the same time, make a buck or two out of it. And their aim is to always aim for the best, which they feel is a good guarantee for anyone buying and playing their game. So they also say that no crap ever leaves our drawing table, period. And Stefan started on his first very own war game back in 2001. And then they also uh, make use of Gorilla Print, which uses small print shops and even their own homes produce print runs of less than 100 games at a time. So <clears throat> after what seemed like forever, and it always does when it comes to waiting the arrival of a new game, does it not? Does it not seem like just time stops until that thing gets here? Anyway... I finally received this package from Sweden, and I quickly, ravenously claw my way into what would become my next stop on this crazy war game train I've been a passenger on since the days of yore when I ordered that copy of Battle Hymn from Avalon Hill one summer long ago. So there I sit with this thing in my hands. It's cover depicting two German soldiers who, through the particular style of art design, that was chosen looked even more menacing and war-worn than they perhaps already did. Uh, the top says Army Group Narva, and as if to better explain or offer some sort of validation regarding this title, the words along the bottom simply read, Fight Without Mercy, and uh, this would in fact be the case. Now this didn't come in a box, I missed a boat on that, but I had a, a Ziploc version, and this is a not too thick uh, copy and when I emptied the contents I was left with one full counter sheet one small counter sheet a map your rule book of course and uh, that ominous cover sheet and its companion back sheet that described in brief the particular situation in which I would be immersing myself so I guess I'll describe the counters first definitely not glossy by any means the only problem I would have really is punching them out for uh, any haste in doing so would have left major problems by way of terrors and other wargamer specific nightmares you gotta be careful punching these things out or their facing would peel off a rip um, <clears throat> which was unfortunate but as long as you're careful you'll be alright nothing new here uh, regarding the counters uh, just headquarters and units with information that looked all too familiar. You've got your attack, defense, and movement factors. 
unit ID numbers, and then these strange letters, which as it turned out would be key to combat. So I set them aside for the moment, opened the map, or rather the glossy canvas upon which I'd be painting with these tiny cardboard squares. Its faded green and blue tones gave an overall washed out look, and the upper portion was a number of charts, tables, and tracks. And this is a good thing, as no separate sheets with this information were provided. And uh, it isn't too big, probably would only take up a third of your typical war game table. So it's definitely space friendly, which be has become more and more important considering the phone booth of an apartment that I have relegated myself to. And I tell you, when I think back of the gl on the glory days of living the bachelor life in that two-bedroom duplex with just all the space in the world to set up tables and tables and multiple games going at the same time. Those truly were the glory days, but, you know, you give it all up because of this thing called companionship and commitment and etc. Anyway, I might add that not every hex is numbered. I think it's only uh, <clears throat> every ten hexes, which might be, I don't know, might be garner some gripes from people especially when it comes to setting up but uh, looks wise I think it looks better that way you don't need necessarily a number in every hex but anyway so I find myself breathing an overall sigh of relief because if the map doesn't have the right look and feel I know I'll have trouble entering into any kind of historical metamorphosis then I open the rule book the guts of the game start to finger through the 20 thick cardstock pages and there on the first page is the prerequisite disclaimer we've all come to know so well. Don't try to memorize the rules. Keep fingering, and as it turns out, there's only 16 pages of instruction, which leaves a full page devoted to setup procedures and reinforcements. Then there's another page with the names and portraits of the key players involved, half a page of designer notes, and even an index, which a lot of these games, uh, when it comes to their rule books, no index, and I have no idea why, but uh, <clears throat> when you do have a rule book with an index, it is cause for jubilation. The very back of the rule book yields a random events table, sequence of play, credits, and a pretty impressive list of source material that uh, was used in designing this thing, including War Journal of the Second Shock Army, a book called Tigers in the Mud, which I've looked at at a bookstore, Army Group North, The Estonian Soldier in World War II, Battle in the Baltics 1944-45, to translations of a number of Soviet directives from the Leningrad Front concerning the Second Shock and Eighth Army, as well as a number of sources not translated into English. So you can tell this guy really did his homework. And when you get into this thing, you're going to set everything up according to the setup instructions. There are no scenarios as such there is just the scenario and your basic units will have the following information uh, turn of entry divisional color type regimental ID morale attack defense movement as I've already stated brigade ID of Soviet and division ID of German and your headquarters units will have their size <clears throat> headquarters ID turn of entry command shit ID unit color ID and command range and movement then you have your command chits, which are used to activate headquarters, which in turn activate combat units. And when I was setting this thing up, and, and the first during the first turn especially, this seemed to prove a little more problematic than anything else in the game. For some reason, I just kept having trouble figuring out just who could be activated. And now it's possible the game is fine, and it, it was just me. But I'll compare this game to something else, which might be unfair, but there is a similar chit pull game that worked flawlessly without a hitch that I played in the past and loved, and that was, of course, a victory lost. And I kept wondering to myself, why can't this game uh, be as easy as that when it comes to this <clears throat> mechanic? But it proved a little more challenging. Anyway, there are also special command chits, such as Soviet Stavka Directive Chit, which forces the Soviet player into a frontal assault. Now when this occurs during combat, which historically was pretty rough on the Soviets when they pulled these things off, they end up suffering trumped up combat results. So say a retreat would actually end up being a step loss. And then there's also a German 
Army Group Narvachit, which allows you to command any division you wish, as well as a German Wormatschit, which allows you to command any Wormat division you wish. So each turn you put all available Soviet and German command shits in a cup, and then the turn track is consulted to see how many from each side can be activated once drawn. Then you have acti action shits, <clears throat> which allow either one side or both in action, and I think these include Soviet and German barrage chits, uh, random events chit, Soviet withdrawal, 59th Army chit, second shock um, out of supply chit, which actually simulates the difficulties of supplying the second shock army historically, and German withdrawal, 214th chit. Your game markers include a turn marker, divisional defense, out of command, and out of supply and out, uh, isolation and pinned markers. So the sequence of play goes like this. You have your air unit phase, a command phase, a supply phase, a reinforcement phase, and an end of turn phase. The air unit phase deals with spotting and air defense. It also includes a refitted air unit return segment and the grounded unit refit segment. During the command phase, you draw command shits and conduct movement and combat. And the supply phase basically allows you to de determine who is in and out of supply. And the reinforcement phase should be clear enough. During the end of turn phase, you have an air unit landing segment and a sudden death victory segment. And again, uh, in the past, I've used this war games um, <clears throat> as related to hockey, especially by way of terminology. And here is another thing, sudden death, which is used or was used uh, for overtime games. Now they have shootouts, but and then that also, you know, why sudden death? Why can't it be a sudden victory? Because you have a side that wins, right? So anyway, during this segment, you check to see if the Soviets have achieved victory. Zones of control, your units uh, with a printed attack strength of one or more have these. And units pay a plus two movement point um, cost to enter a zone of control and another plus two to leave. Zones of control can hinder the entrance of reinforcements. You also have remove one step from a stack that retreats through an enemy zone of control and zone of control also blocks supply, etc. So your basic zone of control stuff going on here. Movement and terrain effects are fairly standard. You have rail movement and you can overrun headquarters. There are uh, <clears throat> amphibious landings, just like uh, that occur the ones that occurred in the actual battle that you can conduct. Stacking and reinforcement rules have nothing new or confusing going on there. It's also during the reinforcement phase that you place any command shits due to arrive due to arrive in the cup, as well as any special command shits. So, combat. Let's start by looking at the possible results first and basically you can be pinned retreat or lose a step and pinned units aren't allowed to attack but may defend and any unit attacking a pinned unit gets a bonus so to conduct combat here's what you're going to do you're going to compare attacker to defender and possibly modify this with supply isolation or if you're pinned then you get your ratio and modify it for terrain as necessary. Now here's where it gets interesting. Of all of this game, other than the history, this is probably the most interesting thing going on. You have two dice, one white and one black. Now the black die represents morale and the white die represents combat number. So you use the result in the morale die and check the morale chart comparing the highest morale rating of each side. Now each counter will have a uh, anything from an A which is the best and represents hardened veterans to a D which is the worst and this represents again morale and uh, combat experience etc then you see if there are any further modif modifications to the combat results table by way of column shift so this might sound uh, unnecessary or fiddly but it's brilliant I, I, and I like it a lot and in fact this simple thing, like I said, other than the subject matter itself, might be the coolest part of the game. So, again, basically you're just going to get a ratio, compare the strengths, roll your both dice, and then look at one die 
and compare that number to a chart which allows you to compare the morale and then that will further dictate whether or not you utilize column shift to the right or the left for your final combat result. It's like I said, it might sound fiddly, but it's really kind of simple, and it adds a little extra, I don't know, oomph to the combat results. I like it a lot. That's all I can say. So once you figure out what column you're supposed to be in, you use the white die to get your final result. Oh, and I, I should also uh, add that there are special defensive hexes in front of Narva proper that benefit the Germans, and basically when combat occurs in these hexes, in which the Germans are defending, any adverse results are applied to the defenses within the hex. And the amount of damage that occurs to each of these particular hexes is kept track of on a table so that it can gradually get worn down to nothing. So what you got going on is rather than the unit itself taking the hits and the accumulating these things or, or getting eliminated, it is defensive parameters set up within the hex that suffer these effects. And then regarding Barrage, the Soviet player gets two of these chits while the German only gets one. So basically when one of these is drawn, you're going to roll a die and check the Barrage table to see how many attacks you get. And then as far as the Stavka directive chit goes, this basically simulates the pressure of the Soviet Corps and Army Command acted under as Stalin's orders were clear, no retreat. When this chit is drawn, the Soviet player must declare a frontal assault with one army of his choice and these were uh, typically costly and bloody so to reflect this in the game all combats during a frontal assault always cost one step loss extra to the Soviet and all retreats are read as step losses so that's pretty cool too then you have your retreats and advance after combat which allows mechanized units to advance two hexes and non mech units to advance one uh, supply and isolation. The supply line to Narva is crucial for the German player and the most important goal for the Soviet, second only to the city of Narva itself. And enemy zones of control do not affect the Narva supply line, uh, so Soviets must physically be present in a hex to do that. And then you're, you have Soviet special rules, including uh, special rules for the 260th MS Brigade, the 280th Air Unit, Additionally, Soviet Army headquarters are handled differently than German or Soviet Corps headquarters. And then for the Germans, there are special rules governing the Merkula Coastal Artillery, the Strachwitz headquarters, and Narva defenses, which only SS units can defend the perimeter of the city of Narva, and only the German player receives replacements. So, regarding air units, the German player only has one, while the Soviet has seven. And uh, that's nothing new as the Germans, the war would go on, the Germans' air superiority would be basically just air inferiority. And air units can support ground attacks and spot for barrages. So victory in this thing is determined via victory point accumulation by occupying specific victory point hexes. And uh, if the Soviet player occupies any victory point hexes in Narva, during the sudden death victory segment, the game immediately ends. And... The designer offers a couple of optional rules for each side, he says, for balance purposes. So there's that option as well. And then, of course, the designer notes, which are probably one of my favorite things. When it comes to a game, he has a few paragraphs regarding that. Uh, gives historical background, some historical odds and ends, and then his design rationale. I'll read from that. He says, this campaign has always intrigued me. And I've searched for a game about it, but I could not find any, and quite soon I realized why. The map scale is small, the battlefield is a nightmare, and the sources of information are scarce and rather one-sided. And I agree with that. Uh, I can honestly say that this project has changed its appearance at least six times since I started. It's been tougher than it was with Plan West or Koenigsberg 45. From the beginning, I was planning a scenario regarding the Ovoir train station and the Battle of the Blue Hills, but after trying them out and changing scales and creating lots and lots of rules to be able to handle them, the game was so sidetracked from my initial goals that one morning I sat down with a red pen, a cup of coffee, and started deleting half the rule book and one-fifth the counters. Today I'm glad about it, and hopefully you will be satisfied with the result. So that is Army Group Narva, and uh, I liked it. Uh, I didn't like 
the learning process because it had some things that, I don't know, it was like trying to work your way through a thorn bush, especially with this uh, shit pull mechanic and activating units. But it just takes some patience and then it starts to reveal itself. And again, the uh, regarding the combat results mechanic with the worked in morale die roll slash chart, I think that is just brilliant. It's 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 not fiddly. It's simple and it's effective, and uh, I like it a lot. So, do you add this thing to your collection? Well, if you're a true war game collector, yes, of course, hands down. If you're a fan of this particular battle, yeah, grab it up. But if you're a newbie or just a casual war gamer, then don't waste your time. Uh, get a victory loss instead and uh, spend your time on that. And that's that. So what's on tap for future shows? Well, I have some specific things in mind. In fact, I've already started research for one. I've wanted to do something with pockets, and it looks like I'll finally be doing that. Uh, if all things go the way they are supposed to. Um, starting with the Core Sun Pocket, and I've already begun research on that, and I've found some really, really cool sources to draw this information from. Um, very interesting reading and analysis there. Uh, so yes, Core Sun Pocket, and what I might actually end up doing is breaking this uh, into a two-part series. It's a possibility, as this looks like it may be running long, and then follow that in the immediate future with Ube's Pocket, another one. So that's what I'll be doing, and all East Front stuff, so for those of you wondering, hey, what happened to the East Front, or hoping I would return, I have done that in a big way. And then for those of you who want nothing to do with the East Front, can't stand it, well... I maybe take a break from this show for the next two or three weeks. That's all I can offer. So anyway, hope you enjoyed this one. Take care, everybody. Thanks for listening, and keep gaming.